the three plenary debates that will take place uh, through the Congress. I'm delighted that Dame Professor Marilyn Strathern, Life President of the ASA, has agreed to, to chair this one, so you don't have to listen to my voice anymore. But we have a really distinguished group of speakers. If anthropology is about the meaning of being human, then we are going to discuss some of the most fundamental issues in, in answering that question. So I'm going to go down there and enjoy it with the rest of you. Thank you. Marilyn. Thank you. In uh, continuing to welcome you to the conference, I also want to welcome you to an innovation uh, for the organization itself, uh, namely this format of debate. The debate, though, itself has a template, and it has a template in an invention that took place in Manchester in uh, 1988, instigated, in fact, by the our proposer. Uh, but none of you should take any notice of that. It gives him no advantage whatsoever in the debate that's to follow. The, this is a debate. Um, I shall name the speakers, but I shall not further introduce them, because it's not themselves who matter. It's the arguments that they make. We have, on the one side, a proposer and a seconder to the proposition. And on the other side, we have, an, we have our opposer and a seconder to the opposition. The speakers will each speak for approximately uh, 15 minutes. We shall then open up the floors in the plural to debate. Um, at the end of that, each speaker will then very briefly um, come to the point of, of, of the argument um, and make a brief final presentation. And we then have a vote. <laughs> and the vote, is, the, vote is actually, the vote is actually very important, as you'll see when we, when we come to it. But in the meanwhile, we should, we should get on because we have no time. The motion that is being proposed um, by our two distinguished proposers, Professor Tim Ingold of Aberdeen University, Professor Vina Das of John, Johns Hopkins, their proposition is humans have no nature, what they have is history. And that will be opposed by Professor Ruth Mace from University College London and Professor Ruichi Yamagiwa from Kyoto University. We shall go straight into the debate and I call on the proposer of the motion. People differ the world over and the study of these differences has always been the special province of anthropology. But is difference superimposed upon a baseline of characteristics that all human beings have in common? Is there such a thing as human nature? You might think it obvious that human nature exists. I will argue that it does not. Now this might seem an odd contention. After all, we surely know another human being when we see one. People might differ a lot, but not so much that we ever have any problem in drawing the line between human beings and creatures of other kinds. It is clear to me that all of you assembled here are fellow humans and that there are no chimpanzees in the audience. I can recognize a family resemblance, but if I search for an essence, a substrate that remains after all difference has been accounted for, I will not find it. Consider the following. Each of us has a protuberance in the center of the face with two holes that allow the inhalation and exhalation of air. We call it the nose. Yet look around and you will not find two noses of exactly the same size and shape. Not only does the form of the nose differ from one individual to another, there also seem to be significant differences between populations. Should we suppose then that the underlying architecture of the nose is identically keyed into all humans as part of their innate makeup to which interpopulational differences and individual idiosyncrasies are added by virtue of environmental experience. Anyone conversant with modern biology would have to say no. 
Did not Charles Darwin, in his epoch-making work on the origin of species, refute once and for all the essentialist doctrine that for every species there exists a pre-existing template or design? It is not attributional identity, Darwin insisted, but genealogical proximity that unites the individuals of a species. All of us have noses, and the more closely related we are genealogically, the more alike they may look, but there is no such thing as the universal nose. Indeed, as Darwin showed, if, there were not for, if it were not for the intrinsic differences among individuals of common descent, natural selection could not occur. And if natural selection had not occurred, then neither Homo sapiens nor any other species could have evolved. Is it not strange, then, that as soon as we turn from morphology to behavior, or from what human beings look like to the ways they act, think, and feel, we find that many contemporary biologists and psychologists have resort to a picture completely at odds with the principles of the Darwinian tradition with which they claim to work. There is, they insist, a universal architecture underwriting human mentality and conduct. In 1978, the founder of sociobiology, E. O. Wilson, published an influential book entitled Human Nature, in which he claimed that the entire course of history could be understood as a preordained outgrowth of behavioral predispositions common to all humans and coded in what he called the genetic capital of the species. And psychologists were quick to pick up on the same tune. In their manifesto for an evolutionary psychology, John Tooby and later Cosmides insisted that all human newborns come into the world endowed with identical genetically prescribed capacities regardless of how they might be expressed, if at all, in their subsequent development. Although not yet walking, they all have the capacity for bipedal locomotion. Although not yet talking, they all have the capacity for language. Now, it's true, of course, that the vast majority of humans do end up walking and talking, and yet they do so in an astonishing variety of different ways. The body techniques of human locomotion, as Marcel most famously showed, are as varied as the languages and dialects of the world. And yet, these variations, we are told, are but culturally specific particulars added on in the lifetime of the individual through the effects of training and experience to a basic constitution that is already in place from the start. So why do biologists and psychologists persist in their appeal to such alleged universals as bipedalism and language, while attributing their evolution to a theory of variation under natural selection that only works because the individuals of a species are endlessly variable. And to find the answer, we can return to the humble nose. As the organ of what has long been regarded in the Western tradition as the inferior sense of smell, a sense shared by most quadrupedal mammals and often more developed in the latter, the nose is not implicated in the establishment of the human condition. Comparing the noses of different creatures entails crossing no ontological threshold. But with bipedalism and language, it is quite different. From classical antiquity through to the naturalists of the 18th and 19th centuries and to the evolutionists of the 20th, Western thinkers have repeatedly insisted that there is more to bipedalism than a certain way of getting around and more to language than a compendium of communicative gestures. They have speculated on how the ability to stand and walk on two feet must have freed the hands from the function of supporting the body, allowing their co-option as the instruments of an intellect increasingly liberated from its moorings in the material world. And if the hands were seen as the instruments of reason, then language was its armature. For it was precisely in their reference to concepts rather than objects, to the domain of ideal representations rather than material manifestations, or in short, to mind and not nature, that words were said to exceed the non-verbal gestures of non-human animals. Head held high, cognitively equipped for language and tool use, and exercising his superior sense of sight, universal man, for this was a strongly gendered discourse, was alleged to straddle the world, the master of all he surveyed. So in laying claim to the universality of bipedalism and language, biologists and psychologists are not, in truth, 
announcing a new evidence-based discovery of what all human beings have been found to possess in common. They are rather retelling a very old story for which, since it rests on metaphysical foundations, no evidence could possibly be adduced at all. And the story serves, in effect, as a quasi-mythical charter for the practice of their own science, establishing a baseline for what it means to be human, of which the very idea of human nature is, of course, a corollary. The great Swedish naturalist Carolus Linnaeus must surely have been aware of this when almost three centuries ago he struggled to find a set of anatomical descriptors that would distinguish individuals of the genus he had christened Homo from the apes. Eventually he settled for a word of advice. Nos gete ipsum, know for yourself. Do you want to know what a human being really is? The answer for Linnaeus and for his fellow philosophers of the Enlightenment is, lies in the fact that you ask the question. It is not one that non-humans ask of themselves. To be truly human, then, is to look into the mirror of nature and know ourselves for what we really are. Nor was the mirror cracked by the controversies that followed a century and a half later in the wake of Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. For then, as still today, in the principle of natural selection, science saw the perfect reflection of its own reason. Darwin himself never wavered from the mainstream view that it was man's possession of the faculty of reason that allowed him to rise above and exercise dominion over the world of nature. Where he differed from most, though not all, of his predecessors was in claiming that the possession of reason, or the lack of it, was not an all or nothing affair. So in evolutionary terms, he thought, reason advanced by, gradual, by a gradual ascent and not by a quantum leap. But this implied, too, that in not all human populations was reason equally advanced, and indeed that in some it had scarcely advanced beyond the level manifested in the most intelligent of apes. Well, after a shaky start, Darwin's stock grew throughout the 20th century to the point at which it, he had become a virtual saint among scientists. And yet the history of, of anthropology's flirtation with Darwinism has been far from glorious. Up until the outbreak of the Second World War, prominent physical anthropologists, drawing chapter and verse from Darwin's account of human evolution in The Descent of Man, were continuing to maintain that what were known as civilized and savage races of man differed in hereditary powers of reason in just the same way as the latter differed from apes, and that interracial conflict would inevitably drive up intelligence by weeding out the less well-endowed groups. But the second war in a century to break out among the supposedly civilized races of Europe, itself fueled by xenophobic hatred, put paid to such ideas. In the wake of the Holocaust, what was self-evident to Darwin and most of his contemporaries, namely that human populations differed in brain power on a scale from the primitive to the civilized, gave way in mainstream science to a strong moral and ethical commitment to the idea that all humans, past, present, and future, are equally endowed at least so far as their moral and intellectual capacities were concerned. All human beings, as Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, all human beings are endowed with reason and conscience. But this left the Darwinians with a dilemma, because how was the doctrine of evolutionary continuity to be reconciled with a newfound commitment to universal human rights? If humans are alike in their possession of reason and moral conscience, then they must differ in kind from all other beings which cannot. Somewhere along the line, our ancestors must have made a breakthrough from one condition to the other, from nature to humanity. And faced with this problem, there was only one way for modern science to go, that is, back to the 18th century. Indeed, the majority of contemporary commentators on human evolution appear to be vigorously reproducing the Enlightenment paradigm in all its essentials. There's one process of evolution, leading from our ape-like ancestors to, to beings that are recognizably of the same kind as ourselves, and another process of culture or history, leading from humanity's primitive hunter-gatherer past to modern science and civilization. Taken together, these two axes of change, established by their intersection, a unique point of origin without precedence in the evolution of life, at which our ancestors are deemed to have crossed the threshold of humanity and embarked upon the course of history. 
So the dilemma remains. The only way humans can be made to appear different in degree and not kind from their evolutionary antecedents is by attributing the movement of history to a process of culture that differs in kind and not degree from biological evolution. The division between nature and reason is still there. The former epitomizing, the, the, now, but now shifted onto that between the exotic hunter-gatherer and the Western scientist, the former epitomizing a view of humanity in the state of nature, the latter the triumph of human reason over nature. So where does this human nature lie? How come that these capacities with which we are all supposed to be innately endowed have been faithfully, faithfully handed down over tens of thousands of years, apparently immune to the vagaries of history? And for most contemporary students of human evolution, the answer is simple, because they are in the genes. Now this response is palpable nonsense and should be treated with the ridicule it deserves rather than paraded as one of the great scientific insights of the 20th century. Genes play a critical role in the synthesis of proteins, which are the principal materials from which organisms are made, but they do not program the construction of an organism of a certain kind. Organisms grow a process technically known as ontogenetic development, and whatever capacities people might have, they are generated in the course of development. And at whatever stage in the life cycle we may choose to identify a capacity, a process of development already lies behind it. Or more importantly, people do not live their lives in a vacuum, but in a world where they are surrounded by other people and things, both living and non-living, together making up what is usually known as the environment. Growing up in an environment largely shaped through the activities of predecessors, people play their part along with everyone and everything else in fashioning the conditions of development for their successors. This is what we call history. So there is, I contend, no human nature lurking inside us that has somehow escaped the current of history. Of course, we all carry our complement of genes, but these don't set us up with a constitution all in place, ready to interact with the outside world. As all sensible biologists have long recognized, the dichotomy between nature and nurture is incoherent. Genes do not interact with the environment to produce the organism. They do not interact with the environment, period. They interact with other constituents in the cell, which interacts with other cells in the organism, which other interacts with other organisms into the, in the world. And it's out of this multi-layered process that the capacities of living beings, including human beings, emerge. The contemporary appeal to universal human nature in the name of evolutionary biology is, as I've shown, a defensive reaction to the legacy of racist science left by Darwin's account. In the descent of man, the evolution of the moral and intellectual, and, and, sorry, in the descent of man of the evolution of the moral and intellectual faculties. But it is an appeal fraught with contradictions. While insisting on the continuity of the evolutionary process, it also reinstates the twin distinctions between biology and culture and between evolution and history, setting an upper limit to the world of nature that humans alone appear to have breached. Moreover, the racism that modern biology claims to have left behind is never far beneath the surface. The potentially explosive combination of genealogical categorization and essentialist thinking is still there. So far from dispensing with the concept of race, science has settled on the idea that all extant humans comprise a single race or subspecies, homo sapiens sapiens. To thus affirm human unity under the rubric of a single subspecies is to do so in terms that celebrate the historical triumph of Western civilization. So it's not hard to recognize in the suite of capacities with which all humans are said to be innately endowed the central values and aspirations of modernity, uprightness, intelligence, technological superiority, artistic prowess, and so on. And so we are inclined to project an idealized image of our present selves onto our prehistoric forebears, crediting them with the capacities to do everything we can do and ever have done, so the whole of history appears as a naturally preordained ascent towards the pinnacle upon which we now stand. So my argument is that there is no standard universal form of the human being underlying the variations that are so apparent to all of us in their dispositions and capacities,
To some extent, even in their morphology, the humans of today are different not only from one another, but from their prehistoric forebears. This is because these characteristics are not fixed genetically, but emerge within processes of development, and because the conditions of development today, cumulatively, cumulatively shaped through previous activities, are so very different from those of the past. Thank you very much. I'll just remind you of the motion. Humans have no nature, what they have is history, and I'm opposing it. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed, because that means the debate is already uh, successfully opposed. The reason you're laughing, obviously, well, there's lots of reasons you're probably laughing, but I mean, one of the reasons, this is a painting by uh, Banksy, who's one of uh, Britain's more famous uh, contemporary artists, and it just sort of, the reason you laugh, one of the reasons you laugh when you look at it is because chimpanzees don't debate. Chimpanzees uh, don't, uh, you can't even, as Sarah Hurley pointed out in the introduction to her recent book on uh, mothers and others, you can't even put this many chimpanzees into an enclosed space without causing complete chaos. Uh, they don't think about these things, they don't talk, they don't do all sorts of things, and they're not a particularly um, social being. So, in terms of one of the definitions of human nature, which is something that's distinctly characteristic of the way humans are, which is different from the way our nearest uh, relatives are in terms of other species, is that we are different. We know that instinctively, as Tim already said. Although you could possibly take the view that the reason we are different is because chimpanzees have had different environmental exposure and if you gave them the same kind of upbringing as a human then maybe they could learn to talk or maybe they could learn to socialize or maybe they could do all these things. Uh, this is Nim who is the uh, one of many in a long line of unfortunate uh, chimpanzees and other great apes who have been uh, raised by humans and tried to teach to speak, teach to behave like a human and all sorts of other things. All of which were, sing especially in the 70s, there was a fashion for this, which was singularly unsuccessful. And uh, many of the uh, chimpanzees concerned ended up sort of biting their uh, ears off the person that was trying to train them or other such things, they got so frustrated. Anyway, that's probably the broader definition. So there is a broader characteristics of humans that we don't seem to see in other species, even our nearest relatives. But there's another interpretation um, of the whole nature-nurture debate, which Tim also touched on, which is not, is there something about humans which is different from other species, which there clearly is, but also, given that there is variation between humans, how much of that can we attribute to nature versus uh, nurture or culture, whatever you want to, to describe it as. Now this uh, motion was a quote from Ortega, but actually it got this thinking about this obviously goes way back beyond that. Probably one of the most fit, famous protagonists of this view was the philosopher, uh, 17th century philosopher John Locke, who talked about the tabula rasa. He talked about the mind is a blank slate. All sensory experience postnatally determines an individual's characteristics, personalities, etc., etc. That's uh, a more recent um, uh, variation on that theme might come from uh, 20th century psychology, a uh, movement known as behaviorism, which dominated um, especially American psychology from, from the 1920s to the 1960s. Now, as we've already talked about, that was obviously a time in history where there were other eugenic views going on in the world, and this was a rather appealing view, not least because it promised change, potential for improvement, it fitted with the American dream. And you know, where you get one extreme on one side, you might often get an extreme view appearing on the other side. And by extreme, I mean total, as in 
the nature of this debate, that, that, that everything is determined by behavior. So this character um, is somebody called John Watson, who started the movement, give me the child and let me control the total environment in which he is raised, and I will turn him into whatever I wish. Um, I think Jesuit said something rather similar. And then there was Skinner, famous for the Skinner box, in which he trained rats to do all sorts of things and was convinced that you could train almost anything to do almost anything. Uh, that photo is him with putting his daughter in a Skinner box, which is probably one of the main reasons why he became famous, because everybody was so shocked by that. Anyway, so what elements of the uh, variation in our nature might be to do with uh, our genes or, or our uh, physiology or our makeup or our nature or the way we're brought up? Well, the trouble with the behaviorist view is that any extreme view, just to cut a long story short, we now know that this is almost a bit of a non-debate because we know that everything is influenced in some measure through uh, environment and in some measure through genes, virtually everything that's ever, be, ever been looked at in this, in this uh, sort of d domain of behavior. And let's take the example of gender. And uh, one obvious question, so for example, most of us from a fairly uh, young age have a reasonable idea of whether we prefer to have sex with men or women. Now, this is a story of somebody called, uh, a paper written by somebody called John Money in 1972, which is a very sad story of a boy called David Raymer, who was born in 1963, and after a badly botched circumcision, uh, the doctor uh, treating him, I think was John Money, decided that the best thing to do was surgically uh, remove what was left of the penis, castrate him, and feed him estrogen and turn him into a girl. And he reported uh, nine years later that this had been an entirely successful operation and that Br David, now renamed Brenda, was happy as a girl. And this became medical law. Unfortunately, this wasn't true, as you can probably well imagine. Uh, once people actually looked at what had happened uh, to David, someone called Milton Diamond wrote up the case. David Raymer never felt comfortable as a female. He rebelled at 14 when he was pressurized to complete his sex change operations. He eventually had a sex reversal to male and married a woman eventually, but it wasn't very successful. And in 2004, he committed suicide. So it's not helpful to actually have a simplistic view of these things. Now, gender might be a special case, but it's not. There's all sorts of other uh, areas where there is all sorts of uh, evidence. I don't agree that it's not possible to throw evidence on this. Uh, here's a paper uh, that was published in Science in 2003 on uh, genetic determinants of depression. So there are, most of us have two versions of this particular allele, which uh, are called the long and short version of the 5-HTT. Geneticists always have very interesting names for their uh, bits of DNA. And this study followed eight, about 850 children in New Zealand from infancy and monitored incidents of depression. Now, we know that this 5-HTT gene is associated with regulating uh, serotonin. Now, the interesting thing, so Tim just said that genes and environment don't interact. Of course, they interact. And in fact, it's one of the most interesting areas of genetics at the moment is how these two things interact. And it's such a huge area that, you know, it's, 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 it, it, it's ongoing. But it's also one of the, because they interact, it's one of the reasons why people have difficulty um, grasping this debate. Journalists certainly have difficulty grasping this debate. They're, you know, lots of people have difficulty ap applying multiple causation, but let me give you this example here. So if you have this short allele version of HTT, and you can probably go and get yourself tested, you are more prone to depression than average members of the population. If you have the long version, you're less prone. But it's not as simple as that. So this followed these 850 children, and those of them that, we also know that there are environmental causes of depression. So if you experience traumatic, life events, bereavement being a big one, you're very mu much more likely to get depressed. So amongst the children that didn't experience any traumatic major traumas in their young uh, life, uh, about 30% of them were depressed, but their genetic makeup didn't make any difference. But amongst those that had had either some or severe trauma during their first 26 years, then those with one copy of the short allele were more likely to get depressed, and those with two copies of the short allele were even more likely to get depressed. 
and the more severe the trauma, the more likely they were to get depressed. So here is a picture right here of genes and environment interacting. So nature nurture is, in a way, it's a little bit of a non-story because the answer is always the same. We're the product of both genes and environment. And there's not a lot more to say than that. So genes, uh, this is a quote from Sapolsky, genes don't cause behavior, sometimes they influence them. So I'm really just going to uh, summarize uh, the two main points that I've made. So humans, um, I think this motion is quite easy to oppose because it's an absolutist motion. And as I've already said, everything is a little bit of both. And so if you uh, don't believe that humans have any specific nature relative to the apes, then you're uh, taking a slightly unusual position um, because including, amongst other things, obviously the ability to speak and a far greater capacity to learn are somewhat uh, unique human adaptations compared to any of our evolutionary ancestors. So ironically, our capacity for culture is indeed one of the things that makes us human and makes uh, anthropology so interesting. But other species do not have that capacity for culture. They do not have the genetic adaptations that enable them to do the things that we do. And if you want to take the other uh, interpretation of human nature, which is that humans um, do have a specific nature relative to other people, that's something uh, to do with their biology and not just to do with their uh, history, then, uh, well, actually, as I mentioned before, all um, behaviors ever studied seem to have both some level of genetic and environmental determinant in varying uh, quantities, even if you just take it right back to having the genetic capacity to learn from others. Um, but more importantly, this idea that training can somehow remove those differences or make us the same in some way or make us other than we are uh, without taking uh, any note of the fact that um, individuals might have genetic capacities uh, is ignoring uh, quite a lot of the um, evidence to the contrary, some of which I just gave you. Okay, thank you. That was <laughs> Madam Chairperson and members of the audience, uh, I'm honored to be here and to second the motion so ably proposed my colleague, Professor Ingold. Uh, I have to start by saying I had to remind myself what the motion was because my worthy opponent, in a very eloquent manner, managed to make it into a motion on nature versus nurture. And I'm going to argue that the question of nature and history is not really reducible to the question of nature and nurture. As Professor Ingold argued, not only is it difficult to detect a universal nose among the delightful variety of noses visible here in the audience, but that the whole picture that makes us assume that there is a fundamental human nature to which culture is later added is to be blunt, simply bad metaphysics. Let me take a different route to this question. Consider the motion. Humans have no nature. What they have is history. We are being asked to consider three concepts here, nature, history, and humans. My honorable opponent has assumed that these concepts are transparent and that what is at stake is only one question, namely whether humans are formed by nature or nurture. I will argue instead that once we try to unravel each of these concepts, we see that the very form of my opponent's argument is evidence that the lure of thinking in universalistic terms, that is not in terms of the specificities of histories through which human forms of life are created, but in terms of some kind of picture or myth of a universal given, lies in the power of illusions to which scientific thought has been particularly susceptible precisely because it cannot bear the indeterminacy and uncertainty of human forms of life, or life as humans make it to be, and perhaps on a minor register to the use of PowerPoints, those instruments 
for so-called reduction of any complex thought to some very simple propositions and pictures. One stand of the criticism that ran in my honorable opponent's criticism of the motion was that it would reduce everything to some kind of constructivist fantasy in which humans are free to do anything completely unrestrained by the features of the world. And the particular example of a sex operation by which the gender of a boy was changed to a girl and the conclusion that he was never very happy with that particular change, I suggest that if we actually had the voting right now, 80% of people would probably say that they were uncomfortable with their genders or they were uncom uncomfortable with their marriages, though hopefully they will not end up by committing suicide. So it's not particularly uh, useful, it seems to me, to take one particular example of a discomfort with a gender change and then assume that somehow gender is ingrained in nature. Now, I want to be emphatic that we are not proposing the tired old dichotomies of realism versus constructivism, objective versus subjective, nature versus nature, but we are asking that we take the contributions of anthropologists towards the realization in recent years that we must entertain the possibility of multiple worlds seriously. Not simply possible worlds I submit, but actual worlds. And ask what does this serious ontological possibility do to our notions of nature? One of the serious dilemmas around the problem of existence that anthropologists faced, but they were not alone to have faced these issues, was that of asking how could they relate to statements which seemed to be true for their respondents when they were in their worlds, but that could not be rendered as true statements within the logical space of reasons within which their own professional writings were to be received. While an earlier generation of anthropologists solved this problem by making such true statements into symbolic ones, a later generation has asked if this was a form of epistemic violence. In the felicitious phrasing of the followers of perspectivism or animism, might we rephrase the nature-culture dichotomy by asking not if humans have one nature and many cultures, but do they have one culture and many natures. The issue of diversity is then moved from simply different glosses over a single nature to the issues of what if there is no neutral world which can act as an arbiter of these many worlds. But I can see immediately that this question will raise for many the issue, is ontology being used here to smuggle in a constructivist idea of nature or as the famous debate at Manchester some years ago, tabled in the issue 2008, is ontology another name for culture? So let me revisit this question through yet another route. Much of the discussion on the ontological turn in anthropology has been seen as a new analytical move to overcome what many anthropologists regard as an overemphasis on epistemological issues of representation in anthropology. They would argue that what the example of Amerindian myths reveals is not that there is one nature and many ways of representing it, but rather that the ways in which jaguars and bird nesters appear to think of themselves as humans with animal bodies is a way of making a world rather than representing it. Now, one might fault these theories for having driven too large a wedge between epistemology and ontology, but one cannot overlook the fact that the political flames at stake were about the epistemic violence of Western theorists who claimed that their ways of thinking about nature were the only legitimate ways nature could be conceived. First and foremost then, there was a crisis of world making in which colonial authorities could prosecute people for believing in witches, as was evident in Africa, or subject them for trafficking with the devil in the guise of animals, while at the same time that anthropologists were claiming that we know witches do not exist, a la Emmons Pritchard. The claim to have an access to the real by anthropologists was nullified in the courts 
in which people were tried for being witches. So on the one hand, the anthropologists were taking for granted that witches do not exist, but the courts were actually at the same time trying people for being witches. The point is that there was no secure route to knowing what was real and what was fictitious, and the colonized had to pay a huge price for the certainties with questions of what was natural to humans was imposed by Western countries on others. For societies driven to near extinction by colonial rules, the disappearance of the world was not purely a matter of representations. Their arguments that certain ways of thinking about nature, or rather natures, were real, was a claim that they could still retain some access to the real. I think that the claims that the worlds disclosed in myths were ways of world making and not representing a pre-given reality must be understood then in relation to an understanding of reality that was under threat of extinction. From that perspective, it is imperative that we recognize that neither the idea of human nor indeed of nature is pre-given. If we are to speak of humans having nature, it cannot be a nature, but many natures. Natures here refers to both external, external nature outside the human and also to nature as a property of the humans, and in neither case may we speak in the singular. Let me turn to a second way in which attempts have been made to preserve the idea of human nature, this time not in a binary opposition to culture, but as conjoined with culture. I refer to the theory of second nature as propounded in Aristotle and then resurrected in contemporary philosophy to solve what is a problem that arises specifically with the idea of nature as disenchanted. Unlike the medieval conception of nature as a book that could be decoded for its meanings, the procedures of modern science have tried to make the real as synonymous with that which is given in nature revealed through the stance of detachment of modern science. One consequence of viewing the human from this perspective is that human action is placed in the space of impersonal laws as distinct from the space of reasons that would explain or justify why one is doing what one is. In this view, the human finds a foothold in nature by virtue of the fact of its affinity with animals but then the human is also distanced from its animal nature in these theories through the fact of rationality. An idea of nature that pervades modern scientific thinking is that of a disenchanted space of laws, a kind of attuning to the world that does not demand that we provide reasons or justifications for our actions. If something is held to be natural to the human being, then it is seen to demand no further moral justification. Yet decades of anthropological research have shown that the limits of what is the human body, human reason, or human emotions are not given in advance. If then one often hears judges or physicians or preachers pronounce with confidence that something is deplorable or punishable because it is against human nature, homosexuality, aggressive women, clever women, you can take your pick, we should immediately go to the alert mode. As Tim Ingold has argued elsewhere and here, the appeals to an essentialist human nature is nothing more than a defensive reaction against the legacy of a racialized science. Does the concept of second nature then get us out of the conundrum that some have found humans to be fundamentally good by nature, others have found them to be fundamentally bad by nature? The philosopher John McDowell argues, quote, our nature is largely second nature, and our second nature is the way it is, not just because of the potentialities we were born with, but also because of our, upbr because of our upbringing, our bildung. Given the notion of second nature, we can say that the way our lives are shaped by reason is natural, even as we deny that the structure of the space of reasons can be integrated into the space of laws. This, he says, is the partial re-enchantment of nature. In this formulation then, what anthropologists would call culture is now called second nature, because the crisis that is sought to be resolved is that of the disenchantment of nature 
and the task of the philosopher is seen to be that of reconciliation between what seems to be given in the forms of laws of nature and the human in terms of the capacity for spontaneity and exercise of freedom. I suggest though that the crisis here is not so much a crisis of the human but of Western cosmology. Others similarly have faced the crisis in earlier times and even now of the disappearance of their worlds, not because science acted to show nature to be impersonal, but because it was aligned with colonialism, with colonialism and brought certain worlds near to extinction. Seen from the perspective of anthropology, one might say that what we are seeing here is the work of history on the way in which different kinds of worlds have been remade or even destroyed. Madam Chairperson and honorable members of the audience, my opponents would like to exorcise these histories by the more neutral idea of the impersonal nature that humans possess. Nevertheless, I honor them for being transparent in their formulations. Other, more insidious forms of argument are circulating in the world today. They take recourse to concepts of nature under the guise that biology has changed the very nature of our being and that what is at stake now is the unity of something they see as life in the abstract versus the forces of history that have acted to make some lives valuable and others dispensable. I urge you members of the house that to talk about a humanity united by the possession of a common nature that will propel us towards the good so that we can make the specific forms of suffering and inequality and injustice disappear will be to disown what is so special to anthropology. It's attention to the detail, the specificity, may I say, the daring of human forms of life in the face of formidable efforts to reduce those who are not being heard to mere abstractions, fallen out of history, out of, China, out of time. Just as in the tenacious will of the marginalized, we see a claim that their worlds will be recognized. And whatever theoretical faults we may find in such words as ontology, epistemology, being, we must be able to recognize the desperate efforts by anthropologists to not collaborate in wishing away these worlds. So supporting the motion today asks for political courage in the face of the power of neuroscientists, global health specialists, biosecurity experts, evolutionary psychologists, to persuade us that the idea of a single human nature can be resurrected to make the ills of history disappear. I strongly urge you to resist this lure of an objectified view of the human and ask you to support the motion in large numbers. Thank you. Okay, all over to you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm partly in agreement with the diction of Ortega y Gasset, man has no nature, what he has is history. He said, man goes on accumulating being the past with historical reasons. Actually, the past experience inevitably influences man's decisions on what to do and how to act in the present and in the future. He also said, man is impossible without imagination, without the capacity to invent for himself a conception of life, to ideate, ideate the, the character he is going to be. Yes, man can imagine himself as who he was, who he is, and who he will be. However, I do not agree with the first phrase, man has no nature. Instead, I propose that man is still traveling between nature and history, or culture, and that non-human animals also have a history. In our society, we can find norms or precepts belonging to both nature and culture, those forming the human family a good example. Claude Levi Strauss, the famous anthropologist, stated that man, since he emerged from his animal state, has not enjoyed a single basic form of social organization. Although earliest society, in its fundamental principle, would not be essentially different from our own, 
he emphasized that if social organization had the beginning, this could only have consisted of the incest prohibition since, as we have seen, this prohibition is in fact a kind of remodeling of the biological conditions of mating and procreation. He regarded the incest prohibition as a step in a passage from nature to culture. However, he thought there was no such rule in animal life. From the beginning of modern primatology in Japan in 1948, just after the Second World War, Japanese primatologists have tried to find evidence of social continuity between humans and non-human animals. They habituated group of Japanese macaques and recorded their social interactions by naming and, and identifying each individual. They found that each macaque recognized individual conspecifics and changed its behavior according to their social relationships, such as dominant subordinate or kin relations. The first important findings were pre-cultural behavior and incest avoidance. Washing potatoes with seawater was observed as a newly acquired behavior by Japanese macaques, and it was transmitted from a young female to most of group's members on Koshima Island, Japan. It was regarded as having cultural aspects of transmission without heredity. In the 1960s, tool using behavior was discovered in a wild population of chimpanzees at Gombe Stream, Tanzania, and primatologists stated started to argue that chimpanzees have cultural spheres of true use. Incest avoidance was first ob observed in a mixed group of rhesus and long-tailed macaques at Kyoto Zoo, Japan, and subsequently in a provision troop at Koshima, Japan. The most dominant male in both groups were not seen to have sexual interactions with their putative mothers, even when these mothers got estrus and copulated with subordinate males. After long-term observations were accumulated, the tendency of mating avoidance among related individuals from mothers' son pairs to cousins was confirmed to exist in the matrilineal society of macaques. Moreover, recognition of kinship is not an innate ability but acquired after birth through affiliative interactions. Unrelated male-female pairs of Japanese macaques having prolonged proximate relationships were observed to avoid sexual interactions during the mating season. In a confined troop of Barbary macaques, sexual interactions were observed among paternal relatives linked through paternity identification by DNA analysis as observed between unrelated diet. Why? it rarely occurred between maternal relatives. However, diet of caretaking males and cared for females, um, right side, um, were avoided as maternal relatives. Male Barbary macaques are known to show intensive caretaking of weaned, weaned juveniles. When those juvenile female mature, both parties avoid sexual interactions. These observations suggest that the accumulated experiences, such as history, have a great influence on the individual decisions of whether and how to interact with other conspecifics. I found that mating avoidance acted as a feedback effect on male-female association in a small group of Japanese macaques, formation of prolonged affiliative relationships between a female and a male, prevents sexual interactions between them, and thus decreases the number of mates and the opportunities for mating. This consequently leads to emigration of males or females from the group. Therefore, mating avoidance may stimulate individual dispersal and constitutes an important factor forming the social structure of non-human primates. In contrast to the maternal society of macaques, the great apes form non-maternal societies in which females immigrate from their native groups. 
Among them, only gorillas form cohesive groups with prolonged association of males and females. Male gorillas show positive caretaking of immatures from weaning to puberty, and young females tend to avoid sexual interactions with their putative fathers, probably through these affiliative interactions during immaturity. Mating avoidance may decrease the opportunity of mating for maturing females in a small group in which the putative father is the only adult male, and thus prompt their immigration. Therefore, mating avoidance contributes to the formation of reproductive pairs outside the natal group as observed for incest inhibition and exogamy in human communities. Infanticide also influences female choice of transfer. This has been observed among primate taxa in the wild as a male's reproductive tactic of forcing the resumption of a female's estrus by killing her suckling infant and comparing her to mate, mate with him. Under conditions of frequent infanticide, female gorillas tend to transfer into multi-male groups to seek more protection, while maturing males tend to remain in their natal groups to share with related males the opportunities of mating. Such situations promote association and coalition among related males and the formation of multi-male groups. By contrast, the lack of infanticide stimulates female movement with immatures between groups and male emigration from their native groups. These situations promote the separation of mature males and thus the formation of single male groups. The occurrence of infanticide may hinder females from voluntary movement and promote the reliability of paternity. As observed in mating avoidance, infanticide has the potential to modify social structures. Mating avoidance and infanticide may have enhanced family formation by providing the, the opportunity of female transfer and by increasing alliances among relatives in the early phase of human evolution. Let's look at the major ways in which humans distinguish themselves from gorillas. First, incest inhibition is a kind of sanction established as a norm. Second, the decision of new family formation is not made by individuals but by the group. Third, emigration and transfer of females or males into other families is a form of reciprocal exchange between family groups. Fourth, dispersed individuals keep lifetime time bonds with their relatives. And the fifth, these strong relationships from strong bond, form strong bonds between family groups. Incest inhibition structurizes human society by shaping the natural tendency to adhere to an artificial norm. However, this modification is also found in its primitive form in non-human primates. As levi said, Society belongs to the realm of culture, while the family is the emanation on the social level of those natural requirements without which there could be no society and indeed no mankind. The most stri striking difference between a human's life and that of an animal is his or her imagination. Man can make his own story based on his experiences and knowledge. He can imagine what he is capable of being. He can evaluate his past actions from a viewpoint in the present and actually place himself in the past world. Such imagination forms his present and future. Ortega said, man goes on accumulating being the past. He goes on making for himself a being through his the dialectical series of experiments. This is a dialectical, not of logical, but precisely of historical reason. However, machine, such as a robot or computer, can make decisions based on accumulating information. Could we say that a robot also has that history? My answer would be no. A robot has no ability of imagination and it cannot act without the information it has acquired. 
The past constitutes one of the limiting factors of man's view, but it is not sufficient. Man creates a fiction about his being. He can imagine what he was, even if it is not true. And he thus makes himself upon his fictions. This is the only ability unique to man. As Ortega said, man lives in view of the past. He also lives in his own story. However, it is fictions. The ability of imagination derives from empathy and sympathy. The discovery of a mirror neuron in the 1990s suggests the existence of empathy in non-human primates. When a macaque observes an action of his conspecifics, he can feel as if he acts it. The visual cue makes him empathetic. However, a macaque is not able to recognize that the other does not know what he knows, and he does not show sympathetic action. The great, the great apes, such as orangutans, gorillas, and chimpanzees, have the ability of scaffolding. They can recognize that their conspecifics face a dangerous situation due to their lack of knowledge, and they occasionally help conspecifics. This suggests that great apes may have the ability of sympathy. Recent studies have also found that great apes have the, the abilities of self-recognition and mind reading of others. That is a theory of mind. These cognitive abilities are linked to those of humans. However, great apes have no ability of imagination. They never imagine what they will be, set their goals in life, have ideas, or admire any subject. Lack of these abilities is consistent with the lack of teaching in great apes. They can't imagine how to assist others to achieve the goal of learning. Man is called a cultural omnivore, meaning that he keeps on an omnivorous diet with artificial modification of natural foods. Such modification is observed everywhere around us. We could hardly live without language, clothes, and shelter. We usually construct an artificial niche with component of culture. We live in a community characterized by various norms based on empathy, sympathy, and identity. We usually control and direct our biological demands with cultural devices. And on the contrary, artificial concepts or imaginative fictions drive our physical and mental actions. Social life and the ability of imagination always push us back and forth between nat nature and culture. Thus, man is still traveling between nature and history. Thank you very much. We now have, uh, we now, now have uh, half an hour or so uh, for general discussion, so perhaps we could have the, have the lights. And I hope the microphones are already, are already mobile. Um, I'll do my best to spot hands as they, as they go up if, as, for, for, asking, for asking questions. Um, uh, the speak, you, you can ad address the speakers in particular if you wish, and they may respond, but after, I shall stop that after a while, and uh, we'll simply collect uh, the opinions of, uh, of ev everybody here. And as you know, there's going to be a vote at the end. So, yes, please. speaking um, against the motion because, as I think um, Ruth Mace indicated, it's, it's, if you pass it, it'll be intolerant, it'll be exclusionist, it's extremely one-sided and totalitarian, and really, I, I don't want anthropology to be split any more than it has been already. Now, uh, Professor Ingall, you began with a, uh, with a nose. Um, this, this whole question about human nature doesn't make much sense, really, unless you're interested 
um, in how we became human. What does it mean to be human in an evolutionary context? And within that context, the focus of interest these days is, is not the nose. Uh, the nose can't be all that philosophical. It's not really cooperative or not cooperative. There's not much you can get from the nose. But the eyes are a big focus of interest for evolutionary psychologists and, and all of us looking at how we became human. And, the, and the central to Sarah Hurdy's work, she is not an imperialist, by the way. She's a very staunch feminist. Central to, to Michael Tomasello's work in Leipzig. He's not an imperialist either, as far as I know. Central is the cooperative eye hypothesis. So I just want to say this really briefly, if you look at a gorilla, an adult gorilla's eyes, it's a black iris on a black sclera and a, on a black face. And you can't really detect what it's looking at. And the argument is that the human eye is cooperative. It's transparent. You can see the whites of the eye. You can, you can infer direction of gaze. By looking at the human eye, you can kind of work out <laughs> roughly what that person's thinking. And the point about, about, about it all is that the gorilla, the adult gorilla, wants to read your mind but it doesn't want you to read its mind. It's not, it hasn't, it's not cooperative. It's trying, to, it's trying to get information without giving it away. The human eye is, is intrinsically, genetically designed for intersubjectivity, for reciprocity. And people who are making these points, they're not, they're not just saying homo sapiens sapiens, you know, walking upright, bipedal, lofty, intelligent, civilized and stuff. They're interested in the key features of human sociality, human cooperation. The eye is a testament to the fact that we evolved in, in, that, in, the, in an unusually cooperative environment. I don't see anything reactionary about that statement. Gorilla's eye and human eye is a good example for evolution. You know, if we compare both, gorilla's eye has uh, lax white areas. And it means they can't read the mind moving the others. But human eye, if a, a little movement, we can um, make attention at that, and then we can read as a smile. So that's evolve. That's the you know the result of evolution, biological evolution. I think you took quite a while to discuss about uh, nature and culture. We didn't hear much about history. And I'd like to, uh, uh, to ask you to develop more on history. It looks like history was taken as just a passage of time, and, and history is much more than that. History is uh, the product of human beings in organized ways. So um, I think that history was out of this uh, conversation, and I would like you to consider that. Um, Camilla Power, University of East London. Um, there is a danger that the proposers of this motion are disallowing uh, us asking the question, what makes us human? In particular, I want to be able to ask a question, well, um, what makes us human in comparison to Neanderthals, or are the Neanderthals also human beings? Um, it seems that some of our forebears um, mated with and bred with and, and produced offspring with Neanderthals. Um, so what were the shared cultures or histories or what were their capacities that enabled them to do those things? Then what about Homo erectus um, or Homo habilis? You know, how are we going to ask these questions? How are we going to compare um, these different populations? Um, uh, and in particular, if we go back to you know, the question of, of the initial genus Homo um, and the great work of, of Sarah Hurdy, which Ruth was referring to, Mothers and Others, um, and in relation to this cooperative eye hypothesis that's been discussed, um, it, Sarah's proposed a, a really straightforward, very simple um, argument that what makes that, what is special about us as a great ape is, is we do babysitting. And, and no other great ape is able to do that, partly perhaps as a product of, of their histories, as, as, Yamagiwa, as, as Professor Yamagiwa is telling us. Um, but if, if that is an imperialist or sexist kind of science, well, it's, it's pinpointing this is what is so special about us, our, human, our special human cultural abilities of child rearing. Um, perhaps the proposers could comment a little bit about that. 
Okay. Um, hi, I'm Flavia Kramer. I'm on the third year PhD at Manchester University. And I would like to ask all of you um, about, and especially to Dorichi, um, about where do you draw the boundaries of incest? That would be my question because there is, um, you know, the perspectivist and the feminist critique to the incest taboo as a transition from nature to culture. And this, you know, I'm just back from, from field work in the Bororo village, which was fundamental to, which, whose social organization was fundamental to the development of Levi Strauss thinking. And one of the things that, I'm, that field work told me is, is it really incest in terms of moiety and dogamy, which classic anthropology called incest? Incest, that's what it is. If people are nowadays marrying for love and they do not consider what they're doing as incest, so then my question would be, where do you draw the boundaries? And then can we apply such a term um, to, to practices that they do not consider as you know, incestuals. So. Uh, Bonne de l'Etoile, Cineres, uh, Paris. Uh, it, it seemed to me that uh, the motion that was uh, argued for and against was not the proposed one, but rather uh, another one which uh, would be uh, humans have no nature, what they have uh, is cultures or ontologies. Now, I think we, we lost a little bit the history uh, uh, in, in the process. And uh, I, I think uh, history, maybe it was because human nature was mostly seen as uh, being a, a scientific notion from a scientific prospect, whereas it seemed to me that human nature is and was, first of all, uh, a philosophical, theological, and legal concept, and as such, definitely has an, an history. Uh, and as to the uh, ontological argument used by Professor Vina Das, I was a bit uh, surprised because it, it seemed to me that the ontological argument is precisely not very historical, but rather her historical, if not anti-historical. So in, in that case, it seems that history mostly appears as something which destroys worlds, but not something that makes worlds. So then again, I mean, what about the, the history making worlds? And finally, it seems to me that the specificity of humans might be that they have an history. And so in that case, I would suggest reframe the motion not as uh, humans, uh, human nature has an history, but as human nature, his history. Thank you. Yes. Um, I have a comment rather more than a question. My name is Sala Sarello from University of Oxford, which is, has to do with the, the concept of nature and all sorts of concepts within science that, that elucidate so-called nature. Um, my, so my comment is, is science and nature, are the science and nature also socially constructed concepts in effect um, suggesting that science has or is part of society rather than separate from it. Thank you. Uh, go upstairs. Yes, yes, uh, pl yes please. Yes. Um, I'm very happy to, uh, to be here in this conference because this is a long-term project that I ask always my students the first and the day last of class, what makes us humans? And I usually ask that question whenever I have this opportunity. And the best answer that I've gotten already is, uh, well, the fact that you're asking me this question, meaning that perhaps we are the only beings that can reflect upon our own existence in a way that perhaps other animals cannot, including Neanderthals and uh, other people. So yes, the fact that we are able to reflect upon ourselves. That's it struck me listening to the two sides that there was a difference in the approach to what constituted or, or what was the evidence for human nature, that on the, those speaking in favour of the motion, it was assumed that human nature was something that applied equally to all humans, whereas culture was diverse. 
whereas those speaking against the motion were emphasizing the diversity of human genetics alongside the diversity of culture. And I think a, a relevant point to make here was made by Roger Lewontin many years ago now, that if the whole human species were wiped out except for one small culture, I think in the New Guinea Highlands, he said, 90% of human genetic diversity would survive, but 90% of human cultural diversity would be lost. And that indicates to me that genetic and cultural diversity do not map onto each other. And I think if we acknowledge those two facts, we would see that the arguments from the two sides put forward from the stage are not in fact mapping directly onto each other, but they're talking somewhat at cross purposes. Uh, I'm uh, now confused by Professor Ingold and Professor Das uh, reading. I mean, I read some of them uh, work earlier and where I could see that they say that human beings have nature, but now they deny completely. I don't know why, but uh, okay, let me read uh, Professor Ingold's work on evolution and the social life. Where he says, uh, as human beings, as individuals, is a unique amalgamation of gen uh, genetic elements. Then he is completely challenged and nicely challenged by Ruth. So uh, then further he goes on uh, saying that a uh, 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 human being as person is a, com uh, is a complex of social relationships. And uh, this implies to me, at least, human beings have nature. And uh, he says completely, no, I don't know how. Then to Professor Das, uh, uh, based on uh, your work and critical events, I can see, I can read them. I mean, uh, uh, that all human beings will react to, to me uh, uh, to any kinds of critical events for a lighter hand, let us take happiness and sad in a similar fashion. And uh, that means human beings will have some kind of nature. And also, you uh, uh, rightly admit that human beings have uh, natures, though not nature. But you say also there is human beings have no nature. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. you. I'm also, in a sense, speaking across the two, uh, or the debate as, promote, as proposed. Um, I th my sense of ideas of human nature is that they are so diverse, but at every culture, of, uh, virtually every culture has an idea of human nature. So perhaps the question is not so much nature versus nurture, but how do ideas about human nature become so socially efficacious and politically uh, volatile in societies? Um, what's, why do we have, uh, I mean, some of them consider human nature to be universal, some of them don't. Some of them consider the contrast to nature to be uh, significant, others don't. Um, but in either case, the question of what's considered unnatural or what's considered natural becomes naturalized, that is, becomes biologized, uh, regardless of contradiction by actual bi biological facts. So I guess an example that I often use in class, which makes what I'm trying to say perhaps a bit more clear, is the case of the Tutsi, where, for instance, in gender differential and in eth ethnic the differentiation, the assumption is that yes, men are taller, therefore they are weaker, therefore they do less of the work, and therefore they have political power. This goes between men and women, just as it obviously goes between ethnic categories in that society, that is the shorter farmers do more of the work, have less of the political power, the very short tra are seen as having an almost infinite capacity for physical labor and have very little political power at all. Why do we want to make these questions of human nature? I think because naturalizing them takes them out of the realm of politics. Although they are highly politicized, we take them out of the realm of contestation. Um, that there are two more people who want, wish to, if you could uh, Sorry. conclude. Thank you. So just to draw the parallel to ideas of race, which were once considered biological facts, which are clearly highly politicized, but politicized in a way that naturalizes them, and that's one source of their power. Thank you. Thank you very much.
yes, please. Is that on? Yes, Peter Wade, University of Manchester. Um, I find myself basically in agreement, more in agreement with, with Tim and Vina than with the, the opposers of the notion, but I wondered if um, the effectiveness of your argument, particularly Tim, depends on a rather essentialist version of human nature that you're, that you're criticizing. Um, because all natural processes, all life processes, can't be described in an essentialist way. I think you know, we biologists know that, as you, as, you, as you said at the beginning. So if you can't find the, the essential nose, if you can't define the essential nose, you can map the variety of noses and come up with certain kinds of tendencies and statistical patterns which can be useful in distinguishing between uh, Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, ch chimpanzees, and so forth. So it seems to me that one can do the same kind of exercise with behavioral traits, whether you're talking about walking or talking or tendencies towards depression. You know, we're talking here about statistical stochastic processes, not about uh, essential templates or fixed biological uh, models. So that's, that's one point. Um, a second point, which is more, more general, is that I think you were absolutely right to say that the idea of a universal human nature is very strongly linked to the idea of universal human rights. So the question is, if you get rid of the idea of a, u a universal human nature, and you talk about either multiple natures or multiple histories, how do you avoid the threat that those multiple natures or histories are going to be deemed, some of them are going to be deemed superior and others inferior. How would our 21st century growing knowledge about two things such as epigenetics on the one hand and what have come to be called neuroatypical uh, syndrome such as autism make your arguments on both sides much more complex than have been stated here. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask Ruth Mays what she has to say about all the transgendered people who've had to, who've been pushed to suicide by doctors who've refused them uh, hormone therapy and sex gender treatment uh, because obviously they were delusional about what they, their real gender and their genetic gender was. Uh, and, you know, and I wonder about the implications of her very clear transphobia. Thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, Mayor Neal, University of Amsterdam. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for a very interesting debate. Um, I have a very general remark about the debate that sort of echoes what was said here earlier. And I think because many of the very specific questions here sort of anchor into a similar debate might be a useful question to get started on. Um, seemed to me like um, the question in the debate was overtaken at some point by a sort of discussion, discussion between um, a certain epistemological debate uh, where on the right side the opponents were arguing more for um, a natural scientific uh, view of nature whereas the left side was choosing more of a social scientific view of such um, uh, for example bringing up examples of uh, the relativistic nature of morals and law in determining how humans interact whereas on the right side we saw images of mirror neurons and um, there was a genetic sort of argument there um, I was wondering if there's any way um, to sort of elevate the debate beyond that discussion and um, draw it back to perhaps what was mentioned earlier by Ms. Das, uh, that what we might be dealing with here might be um, a, an issue of multiple ontologies rather than multiple etymologies. Um, I would just be really interested to see and curious also uh, if there would be any sort of head-to-head -head possibility of um, you know, debating that beyond. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much indeed. That's, all right, last question. Then I shall thank you properly. Uh, first of all, uh, is there anything called learning about the totality of life, which takes all the complexes into account? And will this uh, learning, possible learning about the totality of life, if at all that is, will that uh, dissolve nature? and history. 
Right, thank you, thank you very much and for those splendid and in many cases provocative questions. In a moment, but not, not just yet, in a moment, I'm going to ask um, each of the speakers in the order in which they first spoke uh, to sum up for about five minutes. But before they do, I want to come back to this question of voting. Now, the point of the debate is not to divide the subject. The point of the debate is to gather everybody in this room and make us think about horizons to our subject that we wouldn't otherwise think about. So we're, to, we're together in this. I mean, that's the point of the, point of the exercise. But being what we are, we sharpen our exercises through our critical faculties. And you have finally, please, if you will, to enter into the spirit of the occasion and against all your inclinations for compromise and middle ground and seeing both sides of an argument, just think which actually at, at the end of the road was the better argument. Not position on the discipline, not anything to do with the people's careers or indeed to the, the careers of their own sub-disciplines, but what at this moment in this hall was the better argument. But first, let's hear them sum up. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so, since we started with eyes, I would like to start with eyes as well and simply make the point that it is not eyes that see, it is people who see. Uh, they exercise a skill of vision. It is their eyes that enable them to do that. And eyes change. A newborn infant does not see what a grown-up sees. An old person doesn't see what a younger person sees. Eyes change. You can be long-sighted, short-sighted. We all know, uh, most of us who are wearing spectacles, that eyes are changing throughout our lifetimes. Our ability to see things is a skill that is learned. And different people become, develop different skills of vision, depending on the kinds of activities in which they're engaged and the kinds of environments in which they find themselves. Ergo, vision is a profoundly historical process. This is not to deny that most humans see things differently from the way most gorillas see things, or chimpanzees, or horses. Of course, animals are different. They differ uh, between species, they differ among themselves. So do humans. But that is no excuse for essentializing the human eye or essentializing human vision. Vision is a historical process, and that process is, in many ways, a process of social life that is conducted through the eyes. And I would like to move from there to the question of history, because many commentators remarked, I think rightly in a way, that history seemed to have got a bit lost in their debate, not in the debate. Now, I would uh, uh, point to a, 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 a statement that our, my opponent made. It was a quote, I think, from somebody called Sapolsky. We are a product of both genes and environment. That is a rejection of history. Because simply to say that humans are products and the causative agents that produce these products are on the one hand genes, somehow located inside us. On the other hand, environment, somehow outside us, leaves us out. We are the producers of history. We are the products of our own selves. As Marx said, man makes his own history, but not under circumstances of his own choosing, but under circumstances bequeathed from the past, and so on. History is precisely what is left out in the formula that says that humans are simply products of genes and environment. And I would challenge our opponents to say, what is this environment? that you interact with. How can you interact with everything? We interact with some things, and we are the interacting, not our genes. So that formula is what leaves history out. And so to get to the question that was raised, that, um, that somehow the, the people, um, Venner and myself, on, on this side of the house, are disallowing the question 
what makes us human. No, we are not disallowing the question. We are saying what makes us human is humans. We are what makes us human, and we are responsible for what we make of ourselves, and we carry that responsibility for the history that we have created and that we are creating for our descendants. We are making ourselves. Uh, what is human is what we make of it, and that is our responsibility, and that is our case. So uh, uh, it, it has been pointed out, quite rightly, that the concept of nature has a human, uh, has a history, and that in a sense, human nature is history. And our side of the debate was uh, accused, or was the word, criticized, for, for coming up with a very essentialized concept of human nature. And I plead guilty to that. Because in a way, if we say that, all right, human nature can be everything we say history is, then I'm quite happy to say that human nature is history. But the reason why I am criticizing an essentialized human nature, concept of human nature is because that essentialized concept is continually being mobilized, above all, by evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology in the kinds of arguments they make. And I think these arguments are extremely dangerous and that they carry political overtones uh, particularly in separating those who make these arguments from those about whom these arguments are made that in, in, introduces into the debate a fundamental power discrepancy between science and what science studies. And that is the politics that is pulled in, as a number of other contributors mentioned, pulled in when we talk about human nature in this kind of way. Um, I, I, yeah, and, okay, one more moment. I, I just wanted to ask the person who, say, who re read out something I'd written from Evolution and Social Life. I wrote that book well, in 1983. It was published in 1986. It is now 2013. I have changed my mind. I do not longer believe what I wrote then because some people think and decide that what they wrote earlier is, is, is wrong. So, um, what happens to human rights is perhaps the most crucial question behind all of that. How can we reconcile a commitment to the totality of life, to flexibility, to diversity, to tolerance with a juridical notion of human rights? And my feeling is that actually the juridical notion of human rights has not historically always promoted the kind of tolerance that we in anthropology need to look for. This is not an argument for relativism. It is an argument for understanding difference and for understanding that difference is what connects us. It is not similarity that connects us. It's not what we all have in common. It is our differences that hold us together and enable us to make a world for ourselves. Thank you. so many questions, I've tried to write them all down. Um, uh, everything I want to say, I think, has actually been raised already by someone on the floor, but I just raised the most important ones. Um, I think somebody pointed out that um, the motion that it was being argued for by my two opponents is not actually the motion that we're debating on the paper. And one of the sources of some confusion seems to be this notion of variation in that if humans are variable, then uh, it must be something to do with history or the motion must be wrong in some way. And some of the things I was trying to say were uh, also raised by someone in the balcony that actually uh, variation exists in both our history, our nature, our culture, and just about everything else. And that doesn't really help us answer the question um, on the ballot paper. So I see that as not a particularly uh, relevant argument. Another case that's been made is that history uh, was somewhat ignored. I just want to say uh, that obviously I believe history is extremely important. Obviously I believe culture is extremely important. But again, that's not 
uh, what we're being asked to debate. We were being asked to debate this rather one-sided motion that humans have no nature, we only have history. So uh, I don't think any of us would argue that history and culture are not major determinants of the way uh, humans behave. So I think there's a certain... Um, the nature of the uh, proposal is somewhat um, being tackled from all sorts of angles that are not necessarily what's directly being argued by those of us uh, opposing the notion. I think the other area of slight confusion, so variation is obviously um, extremely important uh, to everybody, everything in anthropology is really about the study of variation and uh, we were really trying to understand where that variation might come from and history and culture are obviously one of the places that it does come from. I think the other reason why it's quite difficult to uh, sometimes see if we're actually debating the same thing is that everything quickly moves into a sort of moral dimension uh, before people have necessarily sorted out whatever it was the facts uh, that they were arguing about. So I think at some point, um, I, I just tried to note down some of the comments that were made. So um, suddenly, I mean, as, as, as Tim just pointed out, if there are differences, then, um, you know, does that get take us automatically to start talking about differences in human rights? Does it start us automatically? I think Vina said some lives are more valuable and others dispensable and all these kind of things. Whereas I wouldn't really see that as anything to do with the motive or um, describing how somebody was unhappy to have their gender reassigned forcefully means that uh, one is against uh, uh, transsexuals. So this sort of addition of a moral dimension to uh, arguments that are not being made in that framework, I think just to some extent confuses the debate. So I just really want to remind you that I think what we're actually debating is uh, humans have no nature, we only have history. Now that is not, not to say that we don't have history. We are just opposing the motion that we only have history because we don't only have uh, history. And uh, that's all I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for these um, fantastic um, comments and um, questions. Uh, I'm going to take three basic issues which have come up, and I just have to start by saying this is a debate. It's not in our hand to change the proposition. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, so there are many ways in which I think precisely this question whether nature is itself a form of history was what the burden of my argument was. So let me take three. The first is on the eye. And I think here I'll cite you Collingwood when he said, take away Christian science and you've taken away half or take away, Christ, take away Christianity and you have taken away three-fourths of the questions that science asks today. So in some ways, I think that there's no way in which one can think about the centrality of the I except thinking in what kind of way was it theologically inherited so that it became such an organ of either tremendous suspicion or an organ around which most scientific enterprise could actually move. Um, uh, what, you know, one could very well argue that something like if you were to privilege not necessarily one picture of the human, but the idea that we still do not know what are the limits of um, the human body and the human senses, then I don't think we can define beforehand as to which particular senses will in fact become more important or have been more important. Uh, I might also say that the eye is not only the organ that sees, it's also the organ that weeps, and it's also the organ that surveys. And so it's not at all accidental that something like the most brutal forms of surveillance were actually modeled on the way in which the eye could keep everybody in, um, you know, you, you could, could shoot everybody, so to say, because, you know, as the camera shoots things, uh, which is in relationship to the manner in which the eye functions. Uh, the second sets of questions, uh, I want to make my position actually um, 
clear, which is that when I'm talking about multiple ontologies and when I'm talking about multiple ways of making the world, not simply representing the world, I've tried to argue that those who, whatever the philosophical problems we may have with the problems that there are actually many natures and that when people say jaguars and bird nesters might be humans in animal bodies, we have to understand that in relationship to the very specific histories in which the worlds in which people, in which this made sense, the world in which people could imagine jaguars to be their brothers-in-law at one time were worlds at the point of extinction, partly because of the way in which notions about what is proper to human nature and what is it that needs civilizing was in fact precisely being um, put into operation through, um, through extremely brutal um, uh, colonial regimes. And so uh, it seems to me that simply just because the batch like this is history has not been, um, uh, has not been forwarded, it doesn't mean that history in fact has been ignored in the arguments that, um, and that Tim and I were making. My argument was very, very specifically a historical one to say that if we think about that in historical terms, then we really have to think that there are many natures and not a single nature. This is not an issue of variation in general, but the very specific context in which variation has sought uh, to be suppressed. The third point which um, I do sympathize with, but I think that we have to be uh, clear-eyed and strong of heart in actually relating to that argument. And this is the fear expressed of a certain kind of vertigo. If we give up the notion that there's something given which nature does assure us, which is not that one thing is given, but that there is givenness, that even if there is variation, it's in relationship to that givenness in life, then what will happen to our moral universes? And I suggest that moral universes arise not because someone can come to some abstract principles based on the idea of some kind of givenness to human nature. They arise because of friction. And in some ways we need to, what science is trying to do is to take away that friction from us, to argue in some ways that nature in a certain sense will guarantee us something which we as humans are actually, you know, being um, rather bad specimens of uh, God's creation are not going to be able to actually arrive at. Uh, right, and my argument is no, it seems to me that this is only in the rough and tumble of historical encounters that some kind of moral visions, some kind of ethical notions are arrived at, and that simply to argue that there are many natures and that really humans do not possess nature, they don't have nature, and so in, in some ways it's that, that acknowledgement that not only do we have different ways of representing something like a given world, but that we live in multiple worlds is something which acknowledges the force of history. It also acknowledges the limits of how far we actually know certain things and the fact that when people have reduced certain ideas we're about through which some kind of mediation can happen, we can apply those to different kinds of worlds to arbitrate which worlds are better made and which worlds are worse made, we are actually smuggling in certain kinds of notions of power within ideas of ethics which in fact should depend upon the capacity in some ways to engage uh, history in ways um, that will not be very comfortable, but then we know, I mean, if you um, read much of um, Islamic um, stories, you know, all my friends in the fields are always saying that when God was going to make human beings, um, you know, the angels went to him and said, uh, why do you want to create this disaster on, uh, in the world? Uh, and God is supposed to have said, well, the nature of angels is already given, whereas the nature of humans is something which even God has to wait to see what will happen to it. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, many thanks for excellent questions. I would like to give um, answers to two questions. Um, first three, um, yes, great apes uh, participated in rearing uh, wing infants and suckling infants, especially gorillas, males, um, usually participate in uh, intensive caretaking of infant. But how about human and human culture? Um, what it function? You know, um, human babies weaned um, very early at age. Um, you know, great apes babies, um, when they weaned, weaned um, they can eat anything what adults eat. So this hard food they can eat. So their teeth already um, um, permanent teeth at the weaning age. But human babies weaning very early, and they have um, uh, infant teeth, so they can't eat the food which adults eat. So it needs um, more people participate in rearing infants to give, to, to, to prov provision them so it is why human culture support rearing infant by communal breeding. Um, you know, the big difference between uh, apes infant and human infants, ape infant don't cry at the beginning of birth. But human baby crying very loudly very loudly. You have a good experience about that. So that is display to insist themselves. I am not happy. So please care. So that is their, you know, their word to insist more care from the outside. So it is because human mother take off um, human baby, their babies, on the table, on the other's hands, etc., etc. So many people cooperate for rearing infants in human society. It is universal traits. So, and when infant are crying, baby are crying, people will think to ease comfort babies. So that is uh, you know, very unique attitude of human mother and human um, um, elder generation in front of um, crying baby. Um, apes, mothers, apes, uh, adults don't do that. That is a big difference. And that is you know, uh, human culture made it possible. But the characteristics derived from biological uh, traits. And the second question, the boundary between incest taboo and incest avoidance. That is a very good question. You know, why Levi Strauss um, put it, incest taboo is the, a passage from nature to culture. Because some um, you know, insist if it occurs um, between cousins, they have no biological problems. For example, there are many examples in our society, cousins get married and produce infant without any problem. But if this norm exists, then something different can happen. So that is our norm of society. You know, Levi Strauss, exchange of um, females between families occurred 
because of the lack of the proper um, mate in the families. So incest taboo produce the lack of proper mate in the families, and then to promote exchange between families. Um, that is a system of human society. But we improved this incest taboo derived incest avoidance, such a phenomenon. And let me give you a good example. Um, okay, very short. In Taiwanese uh, culture, there is a system of marriage which calls simpua. And boys and girls getting together from different families and um, are there together until the, the age of uh, uh, marriage, and then they get married. But the rate of divorcement is very high. And uh, miscarriage is also very high. That's the result shows this is a real incest avoidance. After giving birth, they have experience to, to, to live together intimately. And then they usually have a tendency to avoid mating, but they get together by the system. And then they have such a result. That is a kind of um, incest avoidance, uh, as ob observed in non-human primates. But taboo is different things about avoidance. That is a system, is a norm to uh, characterize the human society. That is the boundary of the incest taboo and incest avoidance, I think. So, you know, I partly agree with uh, history makes us human. But if we seek evolution of humanity, we must back to a long time ago. And then we will find the, the part of our society or a part of our body um, deeply embedded in uh, the common features with non-human primates. And uh, something in our society is deeply rooted in other animals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I reckon that there are about 230 of us in the hall, and although I'm not formally going to ask for abstentions, I hope very much that when we count your show of hands, that we shall be getting something when combined, approximately getting up to 230, but we'll see how we go. You've heard, you've heard the proposer and the seconder. Um, would you show by your hands, please, your support for the motion. So, you do do a no, 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 you can't mark up. No, no, you don't. Right, now, could I have a show of hands, please, from those who are against the motion? First of all, thank you very much because you've actually participated with more enthusiasm, I think, than has happened on many occasions in the, in the traditional Manchester debates, um, exciting as those were. Um, I declare for the motion 134 votes and against the motion 77.